Welcome to episode 174 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I am here with Lydia Creech. And in today's episode, we'll be doing movies we saw this week in part one. And in part two, Dylan Moore is going to jump on with us, and we are going to conclude our series on the Archers with 1960s Peeping Tom. Uh, but first, Lydia and I are going to are going to take hold of part one. We're going to do this. We're going to knock it out. It's going to make fun. a sandwich. We have it. Yeah, we have a. We're going to. We'll, we'll call this part one is the problem movie sandwich. So we have two movies on the outside that really are not that problematic. But They're on the inside. Kind of fun. We, yeah, we have two movies that we both like to a varying degree. Like we, we don't dislike them. We like them, but there's some issues we need to work out with them. Yes. I think that's. Is that a good way to describe that's a, it? That's fair. Okay. Okay. Um. <laughs> Let's let's start with our first our first one, Lydia. This is a new release for 2017, um, and this is one that you really liked. Yes, it's the villainous. Uh, it's a Korean movie. It's directed by Jung Byung Gil. That sounds right. We're going with it. Uh, and in my review for Letterboxd, Zach texted me about this because I just went full on. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's the, it, I want to say like it's not blonde, <laughs> which it. The setup for The Villainous is it opens up and it's this amazingly choreographed fight scene, uh, kind of like Hardcore Henry, I guess. It's from the perspective of our protagonist. And they like fight down a hallway and take out all these bad guys. And then towards the end of the scene, it's just the camera like swoops around and you look in a mirror and it's this girl. And she defeats the bad guy and then like gets caught by the police and then the rest of the movie is like why is she like this what happened to her what happens to her after this uh and she's stone cold and really cool and like everything that atomic blonde was like trying to be (laughs) i think without the obnoxious needle drops what's this one what's this one about is it kind of a similar plot (sighs) this one Thankfully, it does without like any kind of double crossing entry. Yeah, because uh, Atomic Blonde, one of the issues with that one, I think was, we talked about it, is just so damn confusing. And this one is not necessarily any less confusing because of the way it's structured. It starts in media res, and it's the villainous getting revenge for some bad thing that has happened to her. And then after she gets caught by the police and put in a facility to be like a government assassin, <laughs> or she gets like training in hand to hand combat and like putting on makeup and then going deep cover to do assassination <laughs> missions. But she was also already like that because she already has hand to hand combat because she was in a gang with this guy that <laughs> manipulated her and she loved anyway. But this is all back and forth and the timeline's a little bit confused. But Unlike Atomic Blonde, which also had a very confused timeline and like all these frame stories that didn't work, the villainous is always really engaging. I said underneath that one of the things, at least the Korean movies that have come over here and done moderately well, are these wild tone shifts because the villainous is kind of a domestic drama sandwich we're doing sandwiches this episode and it starts out with this kind of insane action and choreographed fight scenes and in the middle we get this personal drama about why the villainous the the title is the way she is and how she's trying to change her life and it's this really cute kind of rom-com-y thing that starts happening (laughs) that I really, really dug because the agency that she gets captured in after the first scene sets her up with another agent who's supposed to be her handler, but they're lot, but he's lying to her because she's not supposed to know that he's her handler, I guess. And that, but he's falling in love with her and she's falling in love with him and she's got a kid and it's really cute. But then she finds out she's been lied to and it's like this whole new revenge thing gets kicked off and we're back. Jordan talked about this like motorcycle fight scene and more insane action on a bus. Uh, (laughs) So it kind of goes back to where it was in the beginning, but it pulls it off. I was always with it. If it sounds kind of confusing, me trying to describe the plot, that's okay. That's how the experience of the movie is. 
but I was way more willing to go with it than I was with Atomic Blonde. It even has a similar, like, tie a rope around a guy's neck and jump out a window, like, execution huh. gag yeah. kill. <laughs> Again, way cooler in The Villainous. I bought it. <laughs> even though she's just as tiny and unbelievable as yeah. Charlie's Theron is, is this, like, killing machine. Huh. All right. Uh, well, it's the villainous... fun and fantastic. It's on Amazon if you're interested. All right. It's uh, for available for renting, renting, buying, all that stuff. All right. The Villainous. Um, our first problematic sandwich <laughs> movie is uh, Three Billboards Outside Ebby, Missouri. Uh, I talked about it about like a month or so ago, um, but it's re- uh, written and directed by Martin McDonough, and it stars uh, Frances McDormand as this mother who uh, puts up these billboards in this small town in Missouri to ch- personally challenge the local authorities, uh, namely Woody Harrelson, the the police chief, uh, to solve the the the. Uh, murder of her daughter her daughter was was raped and murdered uh you know a number of months prior to her deciding to do this because they because and she does this because she's uh you know angry that they have not been able to fa- catch the culprit up to this point um i already talked about it a little bit um you know when i initially saw it but lydia i want to hear your thoughts and then we can kind of dig into it okay um i guess i'll lay this out by saying I really like In Bruges. In Bruges? Said that wrong. Damn it. Uh, do not really like Seven Psychopaths. But I was very hopeful, like seeing the trailers for this, because what I'm here for in 2017 is unabashed expressions of women being kind of shitty and mad and problematic and getting away with it, basically. That's what I responded to so strongly. And L, and just based on the trailers, I was like, "Oh, this is going to be a movie about Frances McDormand being angry and hurt and lashing out in a dark, funny way." But unfortunately, in my view, this her uh, character arc was paired with and like had equal time with on screen this character arc of a uh, racist the cop that's the only way to say that played by Sam Rockwell named Dixon and his arc is kind of he's hurt and shitty and angry and tortures black people in custody but it's because he's misunderstood and someone the police chief that Francis McDormand is blaming for not investigating her daughter's death believes in him so And it reads as a redemption arc. I know you don't necessarily see it that way. But at the end of the movie, McDormand and uh, Rockwell are kind of like, oh, they've come to an understanding and they're going to get over this. Their hurt together is how is how it reads. And that's fucking wrong. And I, I, I wasn't here for that. And I'm angry that her story had to share space with his story and the way their stories were resolved were saying messages that I I don't believe in and I don't think McDonough fully explores or understands, especially as an Irish person. Irish? Yeah, but he grew up in London. Like, there are some American political things that are grossly mishandled i'm gonna say that uh you talked zach in your review i went back and listened about how you liked it because it wasn't necessarily politically correct um and i'm coming to a point where i don't understand what that means uh or what the value of not being politically correct is i think um a better way to describe is that this movie I think it's it's just like like you described at the beginning it's a very angry movie and I think it just kind of lashes in, in every direction and so I guess less it's it being not politically correct but it's just unabashedly you know rage and you know it's just raging constantly and it kind of just it kind of just goes after just whatever without any uh you know without any i guess you know trying to you know 
think logically on why, on, on like why this action should happen. I, I think that, you know, Frances McDormand does that a lot where she just kind of does something because she's angry from, you know, just the predicament she's been put into. Um, I definitely agree with some of the criticisms, um, that have been kind of surrounding the movie. I know a lot of people have just kind of strongly dismissed it because they don't, they, they have a lot of issues with the Sam Rockwell character arc and some of the, some of the, uh, the, the, the plot points of this movie. Um, I don't, I, I don't think I've, I, I dislike the movie. I still think I do like it. I think that my, admiration for it has diminished in the time since I saw it. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, to me, I think if you're going to make a really, really angry, dark comedy movie, you don't get to let your characters off the hook at the end. Uh, People have compared this to Coen Brothers, and to me, it reminded me of Ben Wheatley's films, uh, Free Fire that came out this year. And even in Bruges, because I remember watching in Bruges and the end happened and I just felt like empty and drained and gross. And it, like it's a very bleak outlook and giving the McDermott character and the Rockwell character just a chance at the end to like, Oh, are they going to work out their issues? Maybe, which is like how that reads. I, that's a false step. And, but gross <laughs> I guess I just didn't read it like they were like they were gonna I didn't, they I didn't gonna read it like they guy? were gonna solve anything <laughs> because the, the, the I don't think I, I, I don't think that that's you know because I, I think that they both kind of or at least I, I would like to think that you know nobody they, they they recognize that by murdering the guy that's not gonna that's that won't solve anything that won't get him his job back and then and recognizing it that feels back. like oh it, they learned something and I <sighs> them learning something I think was the wrong way for this movie to go especially considering uh, Sam Rockwell's character is like a symptom of some of the political issues that McDonough tackles and and not like a character in and of himself. He like, so it doesn't wind up actually saying anything about police brutality or racial relationships or power dynamics. And that's a disservice. And I'm, it made me really unhappy. That's fair. I, and I get that. Um, but McDormand was really good. <laughs> she's very good in this one. <laughs> she, she, yeah, I think she's, I, I, she's, she's pretty fantastic. I'm gonna um, get some coveralls and sh- do an undercut and kick teenagers <laughs> in the crotch. I'm fine with this. <laughs> Definitely. Um, well, three billboards outside Emmy, Missouri. It's in the theaters now. If you're if you're inclined. Um, but yeah, our next movie is Wind River. It came out earlier this year. It's the uh, directorial debut of Taylor Sheridan, who wrote Sicario and uh, Hell or High Water, I believe, as well. Chris Pine, yeah, Hell or High Water. Um, and uh, but he wrote and directed this one. It stars Jeremy Renner as this tracker uh, living in Wyoming who um, helps the, an, F- an FBI agent played by Elizabeth Olsen to investigate the, uh, the murder of this young Native American woman. Uh, and yeah, it, it, it's kind of it, I uh, I just caught it because I'm trying to catch up with 2017 movies. Um, I liked it. I, I, I liked it uh, well enough. I don't think that it was as strong as Hell or High Water or Sicario. I think those were much tightly written films. Um, I liked Cowboy Jeremy Renner. I kind of wanted this. I, I kind of want to see more movies where he plays a cowboy. Yeah, like I think he's a good cowboy. I think we need to get more movies of him being a cowboy. Um, but yeah, I, I, but I, I don't. Know. I think that this. I think it's fine. I don't think it's anything profound or amazing. Um, it's all. It's always nice to see John Barenthal and stuff. I liked his small little role that he has late in the movie. Um, yeah, the but yeah. problematic part, the reason this is in the middle of our problematic sandwich, 
is that it's uh, there's like text I think at the end of the film that comes up and it's like there are no statistics on missing Native American women and so the plot of this film is Jeremy Renner's trying to solve the rape and murder of this teenage uh, Native American woman and so it's founded on this trauma of this group of people and then a white person comes in and it turns into a lesson for white people, I guess. Um, like, <laughs> and I can see how that is deeply offensive to the community being representative. And I kind of have the sense that maybe this was written and would have made more sense if Jeremy Renner's character had actually been like Native American or a part of the community. But... but because yeah, the way it's, Hollywood it's, is, like, may, you like need a star or something, which is also gross and offensive, I guess. Uh, well, it's it's a little strange because it's like he's this like insane tracker. You know, he can find anything. Yes, see, and he's like the one white guy on the reservation. <laughs> it's, but he's like, oh, I'm the best. I'm the best tracker. But it's the that's the one. It's the one Jeremy Renner looking white guy on the on the entire reservation. <laughs> And, like, that becomes a sticking point for a lot of people. I will say I really like these neo-Westerns that Ty Sheridan has been involved in. I like the Westerns that are set, not necessarily in the West, but, like, very cold places uh, that kind of are re-examining just, like, these American myths, like Hell or High Water, you know, it's the banks versus the common people. But, I mean, <sighs> the guy at my local movie store when I was renting Wind River really liked it. But he goes, Harvey Weinstein's involved, so it's probably not going to win any Oscars now. So you also have like, this outside. Well, no. Well, no, it's 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 completely been Jeremy Renner worked to uh, and Ty Sheridan and they worked really hard to it's not it's not associated with the Weinstein company anymore. I think Lionsgate is distributing it now. Uh, but there, I think, are just deep problems in it from the outset that I understand that people are not going to get over. And I do think it's trying to say I like trying to do some like allyship things and highlight a really important issue of violence against this community of people. But uh, you know, maybe they should tell their own stories, and that should be highlighted. I don't know. Yeah, it's in it, can, it, I think <laughs> it. It it does try to like investigate a little bit the 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 relationship between, um, you know these the, the pretty much the white people versus the Native Americans in terms of the the kind of uh, quotations villains who. You, they kind of come across later in the film, but yeah, it's just I think having this 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 white uh, saviorish, you know, John Wayneish character in the middle, played by Jeremy Renner. It's just um, I think that's where it kind of just I don't know. For me, it it was less problematic, but more just kind of. Uh, more curious because yeah it just kind of it just was like uh it didn't deter the movie for me but it was but i i do think that it's a it's a valid point that's yeah, and i up. think that's the thing like you can really enjoy this movie and like put that on a shelf and the mystery is good and the suspense is good and the performances are all really good elizabeth, elizabeth <laughs> yes, Olsen does a good she's job she's amazing but <sighs> the like all these underlying background things and i don't know yeah. I understand the um, response. <laughs> sure. Uh, Wind River, you can rent it. It's uh, it's readily available to be rented or bought or what have you. Um, our last movie is one that I, another <laughs> one I was catching up with. This one is, this one, I mean, it has its problems, I'll say, but it's not deeply problematic. It is Valerian in the City of a Thousand Planets, the latest from Luc Besson. Uh, he wrote and directed this one, and it stars Dane DeHaan, Cara Delevingne, Clive Owen, and the goddess herself, Space Rihanna, 
who was sadly spoiler alert taken from us way too soon in this movie she died and i was deeply i was deeply upset i was like are you kidding me like this was like 90 percent of the reason i was i was like this is 90 percent of the reason i was watching this movie and you killed the character i cared about most i wanted to see space rihanna i was so excited when she shows up and then she was just taken from us i was just let her and her metrosexual pimp played by ethan hawk live in freedom um, I was asking if this was Warcraft weird before we started the episode. It's, it's pretty work. Like it's it's kind of it's in that realm of Warcraft where actually I take that back. It's not as I think Warcraft story is a lot better. Uh, the the thing with Valerian is the I, the the acting's not great. Dane DeHaan and Cara Delevingne are are kind of miscast in these two lead <laughs> roles. I think I think you like Dane like they're fine, but I think you needed somebody. They were trying to kind of build Dane DeHaan. It seemed like as this he doesn't seem like a leading swash- man. He's not Errol yeah, well, Flynn. They're trying to, they, well, that's what they're trying to bill him as this Errol Flynn, Harrison Ford, swashbuckling, you know, charming leading man. And he's not very charming. He just he's, he's kind of monotone and, and, and just distant. And Cara Delevingne is fine, but she doesn't, you know, again, she, they're not really given much. The The dialogue in this is, is must have been written by like, it's like Luke Besson gave it to his like, second grader and said here you write the dialogue i'll do the other stuff is this based Um, on a graphic novel did i make that yeah it's based on a comic book series called uh, of valerian and laureline um that's 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 deeply popular in like france It might be, but I mean that doesn't like excuse it for. I mean, just the the if you watch ten minutes of it, you're just super bored by them talking. I, uh, I shouldn't be that bored by them. I don't know. For some reason, movies like this don't grab me. And I know Nathan was really excited about this movie. I was really excited about this. Also, I, I'll, I'll say like the thing that's great about this movie is I've never seen a more like like visually conceptually creative movie like it's so insane the just vast amounts of different creatures and worlds and in just combinations of stuff because you could you could label this as like a Star Wars Guardian of the Galaxy ripoff but I think it separates itself because it has more creativity and like it's pinky than any of the recent Star Wars or Guardian of the, of the Galaxy has and I like both I like those movies but this is so like just the 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 imagination that goes to all these worlds and all these you know characters Characters and all this like it's just I mean I, I mentioned the metrosexual pimp played by Ethan Hawke but like he's such a just like you you're immediately drawn to him not only because it's Ethan Hawke but also because he's just so strange looking he's so out of place you're just like what is this guy's deal I gotta know more um and like that's that's almost what like makes R- uh, Rihanna in this like almost an outlier because she kind of has this natural you know she's the, she has this natural beauty to her because she's the goddess Rihanna and um and and so she almost like doesn't fit in with this like you know surrealist uh utopia that's being built in valerian in the city of the a thousand planets i put on letterbox though that after watching this i was kind of just like they should just let out like the wachowskis oh, make a star wars I'm sorry, movie I'm not here this for is the what wachowskis. It, uh, like like that's this is what it felt like it felt like it, it, it felt like if lucas film was like yeah the which yeah wachowski siblings you're more than welcome to make a star wars movie this is like what they would come up with <laughs> it's that's a but sensibility it, but it i can't have, handle it, it doesn't it it doesn't have have like the um i don't know it doesn't it, it it lacks the charm that like speed racer and a couple of their other movies in cloud atlas has um i don't know i think i think it's i think it's like this strange midnight movie like it, it's it's a good it's a good midnight with movie. your it's friends a good, like late yeah get your friends get a little buzzed like make it late at night like it's a strange movie that you can kind of poke fun at it does have this really beautiful sequence kind of early on in the film where this planet is being destroyed that like it, it it's you know the the music which alexander desplat did the score to this like the music set to it and kind of the whole destruction sequence um 
it's really it's it's this very it's kind of this very lyrical uh scene but yeah it's 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 definitely a it's definitely like a nice midnight movie How where you can watch it movie? and it's strange it's a little too long it's a little it's like two hours 15 minutes it's it's way too long it should have been it should have been capped at two hours or an hour and a half okay okay <laughs> that's also my thing but that's no that's fair and that that's kind of the that's the reservation i had i've had with it that's why it took me so long to get to it um but yeah valerian in the city of, the, of a thousand planets come for space rihanna stay for the weird weird stay for the, the weird <laughs> be the tagline except except she just dies and i'm just so sad you mean the trailers uh, oh, misrepresented well, still, I, her role in the movie yeah they should have just made her the star instead of dane dehan Ooh, yeah I'm 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 now I'm now I'm excited for uh, Ocean's Eight because Rihanna's in that. So <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> all right, um, we're gonna take a short break. Dylan's gonna be joining us for part two to talk about 1960s Beeping Tom. So please stick around. Hi there, Cinematary listeners. This is your favorite Filipino podcaster, Jessica Carr, with an important message during this break in the show. Cinematary would like you to know that we surprisingly do not want your money, and we don't want to place ads in the show at this time. That's not why we do this. We do it because we enjoy each other's company, and we want to bring you our pure, unadulterated opinions on the world of cinema. However, there are a few things you can do to help out the show that we would greatly appreciate. Firstly, leave us a review on iTunes, preferably a positive one, because apparently this will help increase our podcast exposure. Secondly, send us a tweet at Cinematary, or better yet, send us an email at cinematary at yahoo.com so we can hear from you guys for a change. Maybe you can tell us where the money from Fargo is stashed, or maybe you don't think In the Mood for Love is the sexiest movie you've ever seen. Regardless, let us know your thoughts, and we will read them out and respond to them on future episodes. Finally, please share the show with friends and members of your family who you think really enjoy listening to us and participating in our film discussions. We also have some cool merchandise that you can check out on the site. So to recap, review, send us your thoughts through Twitter and email, and share with your friends and family. We would truly appreciate it. Thank you for listening, and now back to the show. episode 174 of cinematary in this part we will be con- we will be concluding actually our series on the archers with 1960s peeping tom uh Emmerk pressburger did not work on this one as as we talked about last week we wanted to try to get two films uh to end the series that they worked on separately we weren't able to get the one for last week so this peeping tom was directed by michael powell it comes from a script by leo marx and the film stars carl baum uh, baum uh, maura shearer anna massey maxine oddly and pamela green and the film follows loner Mark Lewis, who works at a film studio during the day and at night takes racy photographs of women. Also, he's making a documentary on fear, which involves recording the reactions of victims as he murders them. He befriends Helen, the daughter of the family living in the apartment below his, and he tells her vaguely about the movie he is making. She sneaks into his apartment to watch it and is horrified by what she sees, especially when he catches her. Uh, screenwriter Leo Marks based portions of the film on his experience growing up as the son of Benjamin Marks, who owned the Marks and Company bookstore in London. Elements of Peeping Tom are based on his observations of inner city residents who frequented his father's store. The prostitute Dora, who is murdered in the film's opening scene, was based on a real life prostitute who was a regular patron of the Marks and Company bookstore. Additionally, Mark stated he was inspired to write a horror story after reading The Gold Bug by American writer Edgar Allan Poe. While writing the script, Marx believed the motivations behind Lewis's murder to be entirely sexual, though he would state in retrospect that he felt the psychological compulsion of the character was less sexual than it was unconscious. 
Uh, Bohm, who was a friend of Powell's, noted that their prior acquaintance helped him psychoanalyze and go into a quote, go into very, very specific, special details of the character. He saw Lewis as a sym- sympathetic character whom he felt, quote, great pity for. Uh, Pamela Green, then a well-known glamour model in London, was cast in the role of Millie, one of Lewis's victims, who appears nude on screen in the moments leading up to her murder scene. Green's appearance marked the first scene in British cinema to feature frontal nudity. What? The themes of... I don't yeah. remember any frontal nudity. Yeah, like a se- second, maybe? And then it fades it's out? It's very quick. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think they try to hide it, yeah. Uh, the th- yeah. Yeah. The themes of voyeurism and pe- Peeping Tom are also explored in several films by Alfred Hitchcock. In his book on Hitchcock's 1958 film Vertigo, film historian Charles Barr points out that the film's title sequence and several shots seem to have inspired moments in Peeping Tom. Chris Rodley's documentary A Very British Psycho from 1997 draws comparisons between Peeping Tom and Hitchcock's Psycho. The latter film was given its New York premiere in June 1960, two months after Peeping Tom's premiere in London. Both films feature feature as protag- uh, as protagonists a typically mild manner serial killers who are obsessed with their parents. However, despite containing material similar to Peeping Tom, Psycho became a box office success and only increased the popularity and fame of its director, although the film was widely criticized in the English press. One reason suggested in the documentary is that Hitchcock, seeing the negative press reaction of Peeping Tom, decided to release Psycho without a press screening. According to Isabel McNeil, the film fits well within the slasher film subgenre, which was influenced by Psycho. She lists a number of elements which which it shares with both Psycho and the genre in general. A a recognizably human killer, who stands as the psychotic product of a sick family, the victim being a beautiful and sexually active woman, the location of the murder being not within a home but within some other terrible place the weapon being something other than a gun and the attack registered from the victim's point of view and coming with shocking suddenness she finds that the film all actually goes further than psycho into slasher territory through uh, through including introducing a series of female victims and with helen stevens functioning as the bright and sympathetic final girl Martin Scorsese, who was, has long been an admirer of Powell's works, has stated that this film, along with uh, Federico Fellini's Eight and a Half, contains all that can be said about directing. According to Scorsese, I have always felt that Peeping Tom and Eight and a Half say everything that can be said about filmmaking, about the process of dealing with film, the objectivity and subjectivity of it, and the confusion between the two. Eight and a Half captures the glamour and enjoyment of filmmaking, while Peeping Tom shows the aggression of it, how the camera violates. From studying them, you can discover everything about people who make films, or at least people who express themselves through films. According to Paul Wells, the film deals with the anxieties of British culture in regarding sexual repression, patriarchal obsession, voyeuristic pleasure, and perverse violence. Uh, In The Observer in 1960, Caroline Lejeune said, It's a long time since a film disgusted me as much as Peeping Tom. In the Tribune in 1960, Derek Hill said the only really satisfactory way to dispose of Peeping Tom would be to shovel it up and flush it swiftly down the nearest sewer. (laughs) <laughs> in, in the New York Times in 1979, they said, When Michael Powell's Peeping Tom was originally released in England in 1960, the critics rose up like a bunch of furious Reverend Davidsons to condemn it on moral grounds. It stinks, one critic wrote. Another thought it should be flushed down the sewer, and a third dismissed it haughtingly hot, uh, as perverted nonsense. This is noth- nothing angrier than a critic when he can be safely outraged. Peeping Tom's rediscovery, I fear, tells us more about the fads and film criticism than it does about art. Only someone madly obsessed with the with being the first to hail a new auteur, which is always a nice way of calling attention to oneself, could spend the time needed to find genius in the erratic works of Mr. Powell. Laura Mulvey on the film said, Peeping Tom is a film of many layers and masks. Its first reviewers were unable even to see it at face value. Entrenched in the traditions of English realism, these early critics saw an immoral film set in real life whose ironic comment on the mechanics of film spectatorship and identification confused them as viewers. But Peeping Tom offers realistic camera cinematic images that relate to the cinema and nothing more. It creates a magic space for its fiction somewhere between between the camera's lens and the projector's beam of light on the screen. So, after we get done shoveling this into the sewer, uh, let's let's get started on Peeping Tom. Um, 
I guess let's first let's let's look at what did you guys think about the movie, and then I kind of wanted to kick it off comparing it with Psycho because uh, I think that's got that's kind of it, it seems to be it's it, the kind of sister film to it. But what did you guys think of Peeping Tom just on its own? I don't actually understand uh, critics' extreme revulsion to it. Maybe I'm just jaded. <laughs> as a, no, I'm serious. As a viewer in 2017, but it wasn't that egregious. Like I said, I totally missed whatever moment of frontal nudity there was. I didn't seem that bad, y'all. I mean, what is that like? Uh, almost. Almost 60 years difference we got going on now. So, like, yeah. between, I guess that's that's a lot of time for us to be watching a lot of horror movies and getting, uh, as you said, jaded. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I've i seen it before, so there's uh, something to that that I knew what I was getting into again. Um, but I think that partly the closest an, an, um, antecedent of movies that I've seen before uh I compare this to is like a De Palma movie, especially like parts of yeah. Bailout and um, and Body Double, right? Sure, and Body Double. So, well, I, I, real quick, I want to I want to jump on something you you said. Kind of, what do you mean by like knowing what you're gonna what you're getting into going into the film? Like what 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 mindset do you kind of have to to set when you before you watch Peeping Tom compared to other films? Well, I mean, in this case, what I mean is that I, I have seen it before. So I, you know, watching it again, I was like, I, I may not remember the movie wholesale, but like I, I, I knew the arc of it. Right. So, but I mean, uh, how would you prepare to like go watch the Palm movie and then, you know, you'll be on the other end of that. Um, and then this will seem, uh, as Lydia said, not almost not as much of a big deal. Uh, maybe Psycho to your point is a good place just as like a point of comparison of how, similar in parts but pretty different they are i mean at at a superficial level the difference between hitchcock wanting to film a psycho in black and white and this is in like a really crisp technicolor eastman eastman, eastman okay. color gotcha sorry no no no. thank you um so i mean even like the dreamlike quality of something like psycho this one feels I'm, I don't know if I'd say more terrifying because Hitchcock definitely like directs you in specific ways to really mess with you. But here there's something about the, the, the actual color cinematography that is in the middle of a, a dream like feeling and then also really crisp on some of the exteriors. But go ahead. Sorry. No, uh, two points to what you just said. First, I mean, you get that really distinctive, beautiful Archer lighting, even though it's just Michael Powell. Uh, the scene with Maura Shearer, I mean, the lighting, again, is out of this world and surreal, but it also really beautiful while something terrible is happening, uh, which I think, if anything, that I've taken from this is how, how the Archers do. Well, no, I... No, I, I... <laughs> I uh, did, just, real, just real quickly, I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, I definitely exactly. agree with you because I know last week I was the one who was, you know, bashing the lighting of Gone to Earth. But th- th- but definitely this one, it, 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 it you had different layers to it. There were you could you could kind of feel different colors and the way they they kind of infused with each other. And that made, you know, it seemed much more traditional with what we're used to seeing with the Archer films. Or also like using a projector as the lighter. It is jumping to the end of the film. It's like, God damn it. It's yeah. really evocative. Uh, but second, to go back to comparing it to Psycho, I was thinking about the shot reverse shot essay about the scene after the famous shower scene where Hitchcock does this magic trick of making us really sympathize with Anthony Perkins. And it talks about by the time Perkins pushes the car into the swamp and it doesn't sink right away. Yeah. And suddenly us as the audience are scared for him, even though he, <laughs> he's trying to hide a dead body. Yeah. You catch yourself. Uh, like, this, this doesn't yeah. do that. There was never a moment for me where I 
really felt bad for Mark Lewis. <laughs> well, well, that's that's what I wanted to, to start with with Psycho is is what did you think of the character of Mark compared to the Anthony Perkins, you know, Norman Bates character? Because yeah, I, I agree with with the points uh, made in the in the notes that you know you have the kind of similarity these, these two loner characters who are obsessed with their parents, but. Uh, you know, a, a, a character I was thinking more of with with Mark Lewis uh, more than Norman Bates was Peter Laurie's character in M. And it's not just and it's not just the facial like similarities. Well, it's just the the like they're both deject you know kind of dejected even Norman Bates's but in 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 Mark's case and in Peter Laurie's characters in, in M's case it's this lack of understanding why they're so uh, you know disconnected from everybody else like Norman Bates is is firmly uh you know, confident in in his in his way, and Mark doesn't seem confident in his way. He he just he has this you know he has no self assurance. He just kind of is going about that that way, and that's kind of the way that Peter Laurie is in in M. He he's just kind of doing what seems you know he he go he, his he, he seems to portray the character by you know saying that this character is just doing what he's doing because some something inside of him is compelling him to do that. While while in, in Psycho, Norman Bates seems to do it because he has control over this this entity. While I don't think Mark does. Yeah, um, I think then that uh, Peeping Tom takes it that notch further of kind of for us as the audience. Uh, it tries to locate that um, that trauma for for Mark and his relationship with his father, right? So I mean, unlike M, which is just like hang him up he's a child murderer and sure uh they they obviously not really care about what whatever his motivations may have been uh but this one like tries to at least walk you to the doorstep right right um and i mean at least also comparisons to uh psycho as like a story structure uh, uh almost off of what lydia brought up too is that Psycho brings us into that story through an outside character, right? While here, um, Peeping Tom immediately brings us into his point of view, um, Mark's point of view. Literally looking through is, his eyes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's there's no distance that for us as the audience member that gets to be created most of the time. Um, and so I think, you know, there are there is a sense of humor in parts of this movie, but in comparison to psycho of how psycho manipulates you in your way into like, um, sympathizing in part with Norm Norman, that this one is just like, you're here and it's just going to get weird and bad and sorry, question mark. <laughs> but it, uh, no. So did, I mean, does that, yeah, does no, that I, sound I, 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 that, I agree. Lydia, do you have anything to add with the kind of Norman Bates, Mark and peeping Tom comparison? Um, Anthony Perkins is much cuter, <laughs> which <laughs> <laughs> fair. No, hey, well, well, okay, um, but he's but I would say the the that Carl Baum and and Peeping Tom is 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 much more like up Kemp, well dressed. Like he he has this air of handsomeness to him. While yeah, no, I agree. I Anthony mean, like, Perkins, <laughs> Perkins is just naturally handsome, but. The way they they make Mark and Peeping Tom, they like he 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 looks like a a naturally handsome English man. I mean, I guess to give a serious answer, if you're locating whatever source of trauma with Bates, it's his mother, and then uh, Mark, it's his father, like Oedipal complex sort of thing. I I don't know. I listened to the commentary track with Lauren Mulvey. And she spent a lot of time talking about uh, Mark's experience with his father is kind of like castrating, and then he's got the camera, and that's phallic, and he murders the women with the camera. <laughs> it was just like, uh... <laughs> uh the, yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, that point, that there's something about the transferring of... Because there's... Uh, who is he showing it to? He's showing it to the... 
and Anna Massey character, right? The girl who just turned turn twenty one. The girl is who Helen. just turned twenty one. Sorry, say it again. Where did I get Viv? Vivian, Vivian right, is uh, the uh, Maura Shear character, and he's showing. Oh, sorry, all these redheaded oh. ladies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's right. See, okay. Yes, no, hold that thought. That's a good thought. That's a good accident. There's something there. Uh, that um, him showing it to Helen, that just, you just said it and it went away. Uh, that he sh- showed her the home movies and, well, one, that the father is actually played by Michael Powell, which is <laughs> pretty weird. I think we can talk yeah, about that yeah. for sure. Um, but two, yeah, the scene that you see him for the first time um, is when after... Uh, the father character gets married again to uh, a younger lady after the mother passes away, and and he transfers like this. Uh, I don't uh, obsession power over to his son. Fetish like, object. His camera. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's what Lauren Mulvey kept saying. Gotcha. Uh, so there. Yes. There's something about. Uh, yeah. That 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 is like a, a deeply pivotal scene, at least in, in terms of trying to like psychologically think through some of these parts of the movie. So. I mean, it's actually, Peeping Tom has this great kind of rhyming structure that I'm not smart enough to pick up on my own. This is all all from the commentary by Mulvey. But that scene you're talking about, the father steps in front of the camera and he's handed it off to, like, his new wife. That this kid has, like, had this experience of his real mom dying. And so now there's this weird distance. And then in the scene where he murders Maura Shearer, he puts her behind the camera uh, right before t- I was just like, <laughs> like, he can't be looked at. So, um, <laughs> right. Yeah, he gets like immediately uh, self-conscious when either he gets looked at in that specific way or, or someone trains a camera on him. Right. Or someone tries to take it from him. Right. There's uh, that one. Uh, uh, Helen and him were trying to go out on a date or whatever, uh, and he brought his camera uh, home with him, of course, and she's asking him, does, like, do you really need that right now uh, on our date? And he's very hesitant and very squirmy when she tries to take it from him. Right. Um, There's also the, the scene late in the film where uh, pretty much Helen has, has discovered for the most part what he is and he you know he he can't make eye contact with her or else he'll start initiating this this ritual that he goes through which is which is crazy what does he uh, say that he can't look at her when she's full of fear or when, when she, she has fear on her face yeah when she's full of- yeah his obsession is like capturing this moment of terror cuz the twist at the end as you find out he puts a camera or camera a mirror on his camera as he's murdering oh these women oh to like God. capture uh, themselves uh, looking at themselves while they're dying <laughs> which I don't even know where that idea comes from uh, I, I read the line from Scorsese talking about this being this you know uh, kind of you know kind of way to see cinema and filmmaking um, did, did you guys think you know, capture, catch any of that while watching this as, you know, this movie as kind of this, this, you know, parable on how we, the audience, t- you know, takes in movies and, and, and watches people in that sense? Well, I mean, in the most overt sense that he works on a film set and wants to be a director, right? That, like, it is very intentionally king it into that, in that setting. Um, now, whether or not this, uh, character is indicative of all, all of uh, cinema is pretty pretty rough and kind of taking it to task. Maybe uh, uh, what were you comparing to the eight and a half gross controlling obsession part of it? Yeah, school, yeah Scorsese let me read it again, real quick again. He says that, you know, Eight and a half captures the glamour and enjoyment of filmmaking while Peeping Tom shows the aggression of it, how the right. camera violates. Um, and uh, this is this almost feels like a, a, a strange point to compare, but um, I mean, part of this felt like a film noir to me, specifically um, when you're seeing it shot in black and white. And I'm kind of surprised, I mean, uh, possibly surprised that 
that there wasn't a dream sequence in this movie that I think that part of like trying to capture the interiority of, of the characters through, through a dream sequence was put over onto him watching other people watch his home movies. And that there's something about dreaming that is coming out of there that I think to your point, Zach, that might be, uh, <coughs> a, a indicative to like our connection to cinema and then also the people who make it right. That there, there is a co-relationship there. Uh, whether or not it is actively talked about or thought about. Um, something about, yes, why do you, why did, why did you decide to watch this movie? Outside in this case, we had a Archer's, uh, <laughs> well, uh, Archer's run, so. One of the things that I've always heard about Peeping Tom was kind of this idea of voyeurism and the camera as violating, uh, This is kind of like this meta commentary on cinema. And again, I don't know. It's just this 2017 and we've had Brian De Palma and we've had like so much Hitchcock. And then it didn't land that way with me. Like I wasn't quite sure if Michael Powell was even putting himself in it because to me, the, greatest part about cinema that's commenting on itself is even just like a modicum of as a director and my weird sense of needing to control everything and looking at other people or or women or women's bodies and exploiting them and giving like titillation to the viewer like I didn't get that from this at all like I don't know De Palma's the master of that and this I think yeah to to your point that at this stage in the game that it was mostly creepy, right? It wasn't like you could, I could see the case for like a sense of pity and like this very distant sympathy that just by the very nature of us watching this movie that we kind of have to bridge that gap. But, um, so not only was Michael Powell in this movie, his son was, that was his son. That was actually his son that he was with, uh, the in little boy movies. Mark yeah, the, in the home yeah, movies. Yeah. Um, and uh, 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 recurring uh, Powell and Pressburger characters came up again. And I think, you know, uh, on one hand, that is just like a, you know, uh, uh, a production uh, necessity or, you know, uh, a stylistic take maybe. I'm trying to not say a tour out loud or whatever, but that Maura Shear is there and like she functions in a very similar way to how she does in Red Shoes, but it doesn't obviously follow that arc and then wondering about why Powell chose more Shearer to begin with. Right. They're, I mean, obviously she's a, a great dancer and stunning on camera, but like, right. Like somehow when, I mean, it's kind of like a production company or directors, uh, like intentionally bring characters along the ride. I mean, I guess movie after the movie, closest you, know. you could get is to like Hitchcock has his blondes and Powell has his redheads, which is what I was kind of alluding to before. Because like all of the actresses in all of these films, I mean, maybe just because red hair looks really good in Technicolor, <laughs> but that's sort of a thing that I noticed. Like all of these women, really, really vibrantly redheaded. To your point about the even a narrative doubling, like there's characters doubling, right? That Anna Massey does look decidedly different from um Maura Shearer, but you know, there's they've between her, their hair and kind of the way they move, but there's like obviously an age difference between uh the two of them that I think is important, but like to the point that you could I could see being confused and and getting them mixed up, right? And which which you did, which I think is really funny. That I don't know how much uh intentionality that that actually is or if it is just like an unconscious thing that was brought to the fore because of the movie. I don't know. And as like a weird meta commentary to Powell, it's like, hey, oh, Powell, you really like redheads, huh? And it looks really good on camera. That's all right. I think Lydia's mentioned it a couple times, but I think that coming to this movie in 2017 is kind of interesting, especially 2017 in a in in the last few months where, um, you know, a lot of news has been highlighting uh, the the kind of sexual power that 
you know, men hold over women. Um, and I feel like this, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of that type rope, you know, walking in this film between Mark's character and the women that he is interacting with. Um, I mean, did you, how, how, how do you see kind of the dynamic between him and, and his women in, in, in this, in the, in the age of Harvey Weinstein and Louis CK and, and others? Well, uh, Partly uh, that there's, uh, 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 I think with Morrisher and um, Millie, the one lady who uh, he takes photos of, um, yeah, the pinup girl, that there's an immediate ease that he's able to set them into, which is really disturbing and uncomfortable. And a part of it takes a, the police a while to actually catch up to him and what he's doing because he's an unlikely suspect uh, to some people that like, he's kind of in the background. He's the focus puller on a movie set. And like everybody else is kind of focusing on the stuff that's happening on the interior of the set, the drama. Cause it already seems like that production is going through hell. Uh, <laughs> like they're having a hard that time production's fun. <laughs> uh, that, that was Powell just like giving the middle finger to Pinewood Studios. Kind of. I mean, and also just maybe directors themselves too. That like you know one that is just having such a hell of a time of it that that what when the psychiatrist shows up on set he's actually surprised that the one what as you call him um, fantastic extrovert is the director. That, that, like, he has, like, it's this goofy thing where, like, he stuns and puts his glasses on to actually see if he's, <laughs> uh, seeing that correctly, which is very, very goofy. But, um, <clears throat> I mean, I think the movie that works through some of that, right? This weird, um, sad dynamic of the, the people that we don't consider, uh, generally, but they, the mother kind of has understanding of how creepy he is and what might be in his dark room. Uh, and I think the potential boyfriend, I don't really know. They're just a friend that a relationship between, um, Helen and that other guy that was at, um, her 21st birthday party and, um, ends up helping the police catch him or whatever. But there's, it's, it's on the periphery, right? Like they, they feel it, but like it is, not directly talked about until, you know, uh, the body's found and then the cops are on it. And then it kind of comes to the fore with the uh, mother character, especially Helen's mother. I don't know. It seems to something about the dynamic between Mark and his victims feels off to me, especially trying to compare it to what's been going on in 2016 or 2016, 17. Oh my God. <laughs> Can we please go back to 2016? Uh, uh. <laughs> uh, just because uh, Mark is positioned as such a pitiable and like powerless character. Like you were talking about his connection with Peter Laurie's character. Like he has no control and doesn't seem like he knows something is wrong with him, but he can't really reckon with it. And th in these real world situations, it's like actual really powerful people who know they are powerful. Uh, sure. Yeah. It's it's it. They're more. They're yeah. almost more yeah, yeah, yeah. Norman Bates where they're much more in control. No, I, I definitely agree because the thing about, Mark as a character that's interesting is yeah I mean you see how his upbringing and the clear abuse that he's had in, in his whole life and of, of course he would be a psychopath oh you know and a serial killer like like you just look at his upbringing and the in the stuff that he's showing Helen and kind of uh, the videos that his father's you know made of him and yeah like it, it kind of makes sense that he would be this sexually repressed you know psychopathic serial killer because he's had this deeply right. traumatic uh, childhood. And, that is not and to say that anyone who's and, suffered childhood and, abuse goes on to be right, a sexual right. predator. <laughs> For the it's, record, yeah, no, no, definitely. But, 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 like, I think that there's there's that level where that I think that that creates a, at least some degree of sympathy because he's not. It's not like. You know, he's just he, he's not, he's not like some anarchic. You know. Uh, like Joker character who's just doing it for the thrills like he like I, that's why I compare it again to Peter Laurie and him because there's just this deep 
uh, urge inside to commit these acts that he doesn't seem to fully comprehend why he wants to do it or he's never really he's never really questioned or or challenged them when while with Norman Bates again I think that he's a character who firmly believe firmly is in with you know the way he is so I, I, that that's why I think that there's at least some sympathy for Mark as a character yeah but I don't know if it that's just not compelling to me anymore like why am I always being asked to be on the side of these objectively they, horrible people sure yeah they try to well, and that's why I asked the question but- <laughs> no let me know that's true it's, that's why I asked the question because I think it's it's right. like I think I mean this is an old movie and it's like one of the first of its kind in this genre so I can't like ask it to, sure exactly to be woke with me yeah. but, but I'm also tired of this narrative but I, I think I, I, it's not that compelling to me yeah. as a viewer no I know I know I know I, I, I understand and I think that logically you can go through what you know and be like yeah he's had this trauma and this abuse and but yeah I, and that, well, that's why i'm asking because i think that um into it's 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 difficult to find sympathy with a character na- like that now just because um of 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 you know these of of the the, the different things coming out in the news with with these different powerful men um Exactly, and so it, it, it's 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 it, it's interesting because I think that that this um, has similarities just because Mark, as this male dominating character, in, you know, immediately does link to to the the news of today but at the same time i think that there is some separation because like you said before lydia that there that you know the harvey weinsteins and the matt lowers and the people like that you know they they had the power and they seemed again to be much more in control of it um and so but i but at the same time i understand your point of, on saying it's it's difficult to sympathize with him they um they they try to soften right it, the the arc or whatever to to not only because he's a point of view character but like when the psychiatrist shows up and uh, he actually asks him about if he knew his father and uh, how long would it take me to get rid of this scopophilia or whatever and uh, the psychiatrist says like oh not too long two years of psycho and it's not to justify it at all but there's this look on his face as soon as he here's the two years thing and like an hour long analysis every week that, that I, for me, I knew he was, that that's like the point I knew he was going to kill himself. It's, it's, it's messed up, but there's like this look that at that point, the ending is not surprised. He knows that there's nothing he can do or that he's not. He's beyond the pale. Like he's sure. not, yeah, he, right. he's not going to be going backwards. He's, I guess at that point, he's become much more in line with Norman Bates where he's, he's come to terms with who he is and as much interest is the path he's, he, he moves forward with is, is the one he's going to go with. I do say I like the trope of the psychologist, psychiatrist <laughs> showing up at the end yeah. to explain to the audience just what the fuck is going on. But in this case, it is is like almost a little bit funnier as opposed to getting lectured about something because the guy's a goof. <laughs> He's like... And that's like such a powerful oh, yeah. thing, I think. Oh, like yeah. all of these Archer films have just been like <laughs> really random, maybe inappropriate moments of comedy. Well, that's... That's that's kind of my final question that I wanted to, to kind of end on is is we've watched all of these these films which I, I like I loved at the beginning of this one where they had the arrow you know but it said a Michael Powell production instead of the Archers, um, but we've watched we've watched these films starting with Colonel Blimp and getting in you know coming to this one, uh, is there a way that you can define the films of the archers like what what is your takeaway after after following along with this series um and kind of the in kind of the the course that it's taken from colonel blimp to matter of life and death to red shoes and black narcissus um to kind of the the, the later stuff gone to earth last week and, and peeping tom this week right um i mean i think it's also pretty funny that um we've ended up only watching their technicolor movies right so like there's and, that, and that's not the, a bad thing they, they they are totally worth it and great i'm glad it happened uh but there's like this uh level of their early or at least powell's 30s black and whites that is um uh puts it puts a different spin on it and 
it's hard to talk about if we haven't all seen it. But um, regardless, I, I I think an important point that I think Zach you pivoted off of is is that the side characters, the fringe characters, the characters that you know um, are not the main narrative pull or whatever, but are are a part of it, and it's a mix of those characters just having such they they feel full. Uh, they feel like they have their own shit going on, and um, the, and that sense of humor comes out a lot through them. I think that whatever the main narrative is, it kind of has its own tone to it. But these side characters who are kind of watching it happen bring out this extra tone of life or whatever that they're trying to capture. Um, that and it's a lot of it's set in England, so you know that's um, important. I think um, English countryside. Uh, the relationship with the ballet, the foreign characters, like he, he, he is an Englishman, but he's from Germany, right? Are we just willing to uh, press? No, 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 sorry. Uh, Mark, the character in this movie, like he has a okay. decided German accent, right? That's not just me. Yeah, that'll no. And that's also like links up with him. Right. So, so uh, meaning that there's like, um, uh, what's the word? A, a, a cosmopolitan, like air of all the cast of characters that they get together, right? That there's, that it is an English movie, but it's more than just English characters, if that, or stereotypical English characters, I guess. So, um, those make them really cool, really good to watch, and to just, like, open up a whole different world if you're used to watching American movies, for sure, like, like by themselves. Um, as we kind of, as we kind of wrap down, any, any closing thoughts on Peeping Tom, and again, the, the kind of series at large? Uh, one thought that's not really going anywhere, but I don't understand the scene in the newspaper office where the guy was like buying nudie photos or whatever, because they're like nudie yeah. photos yeah. on the door. Yes. Like, what's Thank happening? Okay. Of course you're buying that photo. That is the thing, I guess. I, I, I was going to bring it up before, you know, whatever, I went down the line about funny characters. That that whole situation, what? what's that well one, what side of town are they on? And two, like they're just And then like little girl just waltzes like, in. Do you do you have any views? <laughs> but it's like it is so overt of what is being sold inside that store. Like they're outside on the display, right? Like there's no Right, like those women are uh, definitely naked. Like, what, why are we acting so like this? Kind of confusing. Yeah, that that was. You're right. That is confusing. Uh, <laughs> That's not going anywhere. Uh, That's well, my final I mean, thought. No, there's like a British repression to it, right? Where no. like uh, uh, the guy, right. the guy <laughs> uh, bristles at the fact that the the counter the, the salesman or whatever says you want to be on our weekly newsletter, and he's like, nah, <laughs> and then. And then he forgets his newspapers uh-huh. that he went in there and to he, buy. Uh, the salesman puts <laughs> the photographs in a package that says educational books. <laughs> so he and, and he like smiles when he sees uh, that. He's like, "Oh yeah, thank you, clever." But but to your point, it's like that motherfucker just went in there and it's just like, "What do you think?" Oh, all right, whatever. Who do you think? What do you think he's about to buy? <laughs> oh my goodness. Big news. Um, I want to comment a little bit about the music that we didn't get to. The solo piano messed me up. There is... It, it reminded me of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. The conversation and maybe some, like, more intense parts of the Eyes Wide Shut. Just, like, oh. s- stupid aggressive. Which is, like, real Freudian, too. Good yeah. connection. Good, good, good. Um, and then... Also, the the score that so not only the piano but the, the the rest of the instrumentation that comes in when they watch the home videos is super weird. It sounds like a silent film. I don't know what to make of this point that I'm pulling at, but it's there is there is a way no. with, the, with its rhythm that made it feel like a, a silent movie. I don't no, know. no, no, you're to build on that again. Not my point from Mulvey's audio commentary when Helen is watching, like she breaks in and like watches his film. That whole sequence is silent. Like her face is just like silent actress, just reacting. You don't see the film, but you see her. And Mulvey's like, "This is silent film acting." <laughs> just the whole drama plays out on her face, and I was like, "Oh, okay." So I, I, I think that's there. Okay, good. I'm not going crazy. I was just pulling at that there for a second. Uh, and, and lastly is 
just the sound design. There, there, there's a ridiculous water drip that's occurring in the dark room, and man, that was not okay. <laughs> that it just, it just you know, and it, it, yeah, sound design. They know what they're doing uh, with that to just make it deeply uncomfortable. How about you, Zach? How, how's this wrapping up? Being in every single episode. <laughs> I'm in every single episode ever. No, um, I know. But in this case, what is your point of view considering you? I really enjoyed this series on the archers. Um, I, I don't know what I was expecting, but I was really struck with how much I loved Colonel Blimp right at the beginning. Mm. Um, and then I've really, I, I mean, I've really, really, really liked all of the movies that we've watched <laughs> outside of gone to earth, which was fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, but I yeah I think that they they have this this um, kind of cinematic regal quality to them, but they also but it but it all it doesn't feel like it's it doesn't feel like it's capital E epic you know it doesn't it doesn't feel like it's making a pronouncement it, it just it feels like mm. these like these epic texts with these. Uh, larger than life figures but it, it, it never feels like it's it's making something large and telling you about it um i think that it, i think that it has this that they have these this quality that we don't see too in too many movies today because if they if a, a movie is big it's usually reminding you how big and audacious and, and <laughs> magical yeah. it is as much as sure. i as as much as i you know just to tie in with what's happening this weekend in, in mm-hmm. films as much as i like star wars and i liked the force awakens that's also a movie that's also it's constantly reminding you how amazing its brand is um and so i I really liked i really liked the 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 films of the archers because they had these this these larger than life dreamlike fairy tale qualities like we talked about with black narcissus and the red shoes but it at the same time kind of kept this love this this grounded quality to it that that seemed uh really genuine and i i really attracted to it um so i was i was really happy that we were able to do this series because i've loved all of the movies cool. so far except for Gunner. <laughs> uh, <sure. laughs> which i just i guess we just we're just, i'm just gonna put on blast uh, for no, no reason okay. even though i really yeah. i like i was fine with it <laughs> I guess so. Um, well, I guess that'll wrap up this episode of Cinematary. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cinematary, on Twitter at, at cinematary, and on Letterbox at letterbox.com slash cinematary, where we post all of the movies that we talked about in this episode. Uh, for the next two weeks, we're going to be doing wrap up, ep- uh, kind of wrap up 2017, best of the year look backs. Um, so be looking for those. Hopefully, I'm going to, for the, you know, contributors who are listening to this challenge to do our best uh, categories, you know, lists that we came up with last year at the beginning of last year. I'd love to do those again on the website, but nobody said anything. So I guess, you know, <clears throat> I don't know. Um, but yeah, be looking for some best of the year stuff uh, over the next couple weeks from us as we kind of look back at the year in movies. But until then, thank you guys for listening. And we will see you next week. Mm-hmm.